do with the bronchial tubes being swollen. When you take a breath in, the area isn't distributed to you. So the chronic bronchitic pattern is different than that. Now we have emphysema. I don't know how well this shows up in the room. But here you have a normal contour of the base of the lung. You have total destruction in the higher portions of the lung, left side and right. And on the side view, you get a sense that this is all fairly normal, and this is all abnormal. This is typical of a smoker's emphysema. Apical predominant, higher portion, the base of her skin. The therapy for these conditions should be different based on this radiologic act. Next slide. And then one of you had said you had bronchiectasis. This is what bronchiectasis looks like. This is a disease not of the lung tissue, but of the bronchial tubes themselves, where they are damaged and destroyed. And it's like taking a sock and stretching it so it has no more elasticity. These bronchial tubes just swell up and fill with mucus. And these are all swollen bronchial tubes throughout the lung. <coughs> so even though they're both obstructive lung disease, all of you, I hope, can see that this disease is not this disease. So why are we treating it the same? We need to be more creative in how we're going to manage these problems. Next slide. Two ways of making coffee. The way I made it when I was in college, the way my wife makes it now. You still end up with coffee, but honestly, there are better ways to do it than the old way. So I miss the percolator. I don't know why. There's something about coffee that's been on on for seven or eight hours, that thickness. I just <laughs> so what about the therapies? Um, there are different groups. So the first is called beta agonists. These are met medicines that affect beta receptors in the lung. They cause bronchial tubes to die. That's all they do. Beta agonists include things like primatine mist from 30 years ago. Remember that commercial tick, 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 tick? You take a puff, and within five seconds, you feel better. They would show the person going. <sighs> Primatine mists were great. It worked within minutes. It only lasted an hour or so. It had some cardiac toxicities. So you don't really see it anymore, do you? But it's gone now. It is gone. But back then, it was all that you had. And then since then, you had Alupril, Metapril, Proventil, Albuterol. These are all short-acting beta agonists. So we use the term SABA, short acting beta agonists. They work instantaneously. They give you two or three hours of relief. Then they wear off. That was the mainstay therapy in the 1980s. If we manage blood pressure this way, imagine how hard it would be to treat your high blood pressure. If you were told, there's a blood pressure medicine, you have to take it every three to four hours in order for it to work. So then they came up with lab long-acting beta agonists. These are drugs like Salmeterol, Cerebin, Forden, um, Indicaterol is the new one, Arsipar and These are beta agonists that work within a few minutes, and they last 10 or 12 hours, some longer. Next slide. The next class is anticholinergics. So you have receptors that cause bronchoconstriction. When you offer beta agonists, it dilates. Then you have cholinergic receptors that cause bronchoconstriction. When you use anticholinergics, it causes dilation. Two different pathways, they work differently, so it makes sense to have a separate medicine for the other pathway. The short-acting ones are things like Atrovent. The long-acting ones are things like Spireva or Clinidium, which is Tordosa, which just came out last year. These are medicines that last long. This is a 12-hour medicine. This is 24-hour medicine. These are short-acting. They last about six hours. And then you have corticosteroids. Well, corticosteroids have been the mainstay of therapy since I was a kid with asthma. They would give you an epinephrine shot in one hip. I'm saying hip to be blind. They'd give you a cortisone shot in the other hip. And that's how we treated airway disease. But now we have inhaled steroids that treat the lungs directly without the system. Now, one of the issues with all of these medicines is that they each work differently. So then the company said, well, what happens if you combine them? Is there any advantage, or is it an all or not? Well, it turns out that if you use a beta agonist and an anticholinergic, the results were better than one or the other by itself, even when you went up on the doses. 
So combination therapy is the mainstay for chronic bronchitis, for chronic asthma, and for bronchitis. What are the combination therapies? There's a short-acting combination called Combivent. It's been around for about 20 years. It's now reformatted as something called a Respimac. The Respimac inhaler is something fairly new. Some of you may have it. Then you have long-acting combination, and that's Simpacor, Dulera, and Bear. Next slide. We have old drugs like Theophilus that came about in the 50s. Next slide. Then we have things like Valeres, which is a Thoflin type of drug, similar chemical type of drug. They're called PD4 inhibitors. And that came out for mostly chronic bronchitis. And then here are the new combinations, and these just came out. You'll see them advertised now because I guess they got approval during the winter. The Agrio Olipta, Anora Olipta, Sordoza, and then there are new delivery systems, things like handy inhalers, aerolizers, Respomats, press airs. So there's a lot of industry interest in this. This is what the Respomat looks at, looks at. Most of the inhalers are a dry powder now. This one is actually a mist. It's like the old type of uh, uh, Primatine type sprays. You shake it up and it's an aerosolized mist that comes out almost like a nebula. Very popular short acting. This is called the Neo Inhaler. This is in the Caterol, which is like CeraVet. And this is called the January or Press Air. This is Pergoza. These are all different types of inhalers that are now coming out on the market. So you have different chemicals and you have engineers who are coming up with different delivery systems. And this is all within the last three or four years. So this is what we had when I came into practice. This is preventive. You get things like it. There were red ones, white ones, short acting strokes. And this is what we have now. Look at what's happened in just 10 years. It's very impressive that you now have the ears, not just of doctors, not just of support groups, but you have the ear of industry. You have pharmaceutical companies that are looking for better therapy. So in our new paradigm, we're looking closely at what type of COPD you have, and then we're saying, what are the new therapies? It needs to be a combination of a long-acting bronchodilator, a long-acting muscarinic, uh, which is an anticholinergic. There's a lot of interest in these PD, uh, e inhibitors, so we'll talk about that later. But there are other inflammatory drugs that are being tested currently. Then for simplicity, the companies are trying to mix multiple drugs into one cover. So wouldn't it be nice if instead of using four different sprays in the course of the day, you would take one puff in the morning and nothing else through the day. And they're actually getting very close to those. And um, Anora, Lipta, and Rio Lipta are some of the first ones to use these companies. What about things that don't involve um, medication? Supplemental oxygen is very important. Supplemental oxygen to people who are chronically hypoxic, so people who have low oxygen throughout the day. Supplemental oxygen improves your activity level, improves your cognitive function, and improves your survival. In my line, that's called trifecta. That's everything good. There's also benefits of people who have intermittent hypoxia, wearing it at bedtime instead of all day long. There are lots of indications for oxygen. Even in athletics, I'm sure for those of you who watch fall football, how many times have you seen the running back at the end of a long run go to the sidelines and breathe pure oxygen? There are recovery aspects of oxygen. Prophylactic antibiotics is something that's very popular. Eucalytic therapy, things like Eumobit or Eucinex to break up mucus are very popular. And nutritional support. Nutritional support is very important. If you're in the catabolic state, it means you're using the muscle mass. You need to have more protein than usual. And it's very important to be with a dietitian to work on that. So we give our young doctors these little uh, cheat cards. And it's kind of that evidence based formula. If your patient's here, consider these therapies. If your patient's here, consider these therapies. As they get worse, consider these. These are not meant to be uh, templates uh, for every patient. They're guidelines for the doctor. Next slide. 
And then we kind of adjust it based on the newer state. So as you go from low risk to high risk, we start adding things like pulmonary rehab. We start looking at non-invasive mass ventilation. How many of you are using CTAP or BIPAP? These are all things that we use in this condition. And then the surgeries for emphysema or for bronchitis or for asthma. Next slide. So new paradigm. In my training day 25 years ago, they said the only things that improve outcome smoking cessation, supplemental oxygen. Yes. Now they've added volume reduction surgery in selected patients. Patients who have pure emphysema, apex, the upper part of the lung is involved, the bases are normal. It turns out if you remove that top of the lung, the bottom part of the lung functions better. So why don't we do a lot of it? because in the studies that looked at it, there was a small population that did well. There are other people who had no benefit. And there was a very significant group that actually was worse because it's a big surgery. So again, knowing the patient, knowing their symptoms, knowing their anatomy, determines whether they're eligible. You have know, lung transplantation, which I'm sure you guys have all heard, is a bit of a roller coaster, isn't it? So there's good and bad with lung transplant. When it works well, it works very well. It doesn't always work well. It is limited to just a handful of centers in the United States, less than 100. They do less than a few thousand transplants per year for the entire country. So it's really not a very uh, common option, but it can be both life-sustaining and a quality of life-sustaining. Next slide. And then you have a whole host of new medications that I didn't even show on the slide that are in what we call the pipeline, at different stages of development that very likely will change this disease function. And then there are different parts of rehab that turn out to be very helpful. Have you ever wondered why pulmonary rehab is more than just walking? Sometimes they have you lift bottles of water, sometimes they have you do things with your arm, sometimes they have you do things with your hip. It turns out that paying attention to the accessory muscles of breathing, the ribs, the diaphragm, the belly, the back, improves your stamina. And sometimes the difference is being able to go out to lunch comfortably, walking from a car to the restaurant. And that's what we have to give you. I've been doing this again for 25 years. I have not yet had a patient who didn't benefit, benefit from structured rehab. And I'll tell you, the program they have here is one of the best in the state. And then in some patients, we use things like CPAP or BiPAP. These are mask ventilator devices that you wear at night, and it relaxes the diaphragm and preserves some of your lung function during the day. So when we were young, you were always told, don't take too many antibiotics, because your body gets immune to it. There was always concerns that by using too many antibiotics, the antibiotics would become less useful. And we saw that certainly with penicillin, how often did your doctor give you penicillin now? But that was the mainstay when I was growing up. And you do have a problem with multi-drug resistant pathogens, uh, organisms that are resistant to all the standard antibiotics. You hear about them in hospitals, things like MRSA and all these other things.